Hello, my name is Mike Vinsel, and today we're continuing reading my book, Travels with Nobody. Stephen Stroh recalls America in the early 1980s. It's written and illustrated by me, and so today we're going to do chapter two. And chapter two is titled Grandpa Phillips Advice. So just have a little cup of coffee here. So this is March 20th, 2024. And uh, so I'm, uh, we've skipped around a few times because we lost, you know, had to redo some of the videos of this. So this is chapter two. Okay. Grandpa Phillips' advice. Route nine in Vermont became Route seven in New York. Outside of Troy, New York, I got on to Interstate 90 and drove west for the rest of the day. By nightfall, I was in Cheektowaga, just outside Buffalo. I got a cheap motel somewhere, showered, got dressed, and then drove to my grandparents' apartment in East Aurora. I hadn't thought to call. Maybe I didn't have their phone number, but then again, I could have found it in the phone book but I didn't call for whatever reason. I parked in their, in their driveway, went up and rang the doorbell. The old two-story wooden building had a distinct smell that I remembered, mothballs and coal dust, somehow strangely pleasant. Grandpa Phillips answered on the intercom and buzzed me in. I climbed the creaky stairs holding the track of the motorized lift chair they'd had installed years before. I remembered, as a child, we would ride it up and down just for fun. Grandpa Phillips opened the door to greet me, but he was distraught. He was in tears. He let me in and asked if I wanted a cup of coffee. I told him I'd make the coffee and led him into the living room to sit. He told me that just a couple of hours before I had arrived that Grandma had been taken to the hospital. It was clear at the time what the pro sorry, it wasn't clear at the time what the problem was. He said that she'd been behaving strangely all day and then she collapsed and he had to call an ambulance. He had also called the relatives in Canada and they'd ha they had driven down and accompanied her, accompanied her to the hospital. Grandpa was too old and frail by that time to go with her. He sat on the couch, and I, ha I went to the kitchen to make coffee, to make the coffee. He said from the living room that God must have sent me there at that time. What are the odds? He said. I filled the percolator and went in to sit opposite him across the coffee ta table. He told me that he was sure this would be the end. He'd never seen, and uh, she'd never been this bad before. Then he asked me to tell him truthfully. He hesitated. It was a difficult question for him to ask. Did my father have another woman? This was less than a year after my mother had died. I answered honestly that he did. He was dating a very nice woman. I had met her once. I told Grandpa that I thought they were serious. Her name was Martha Sanford. Thank God, Grandpa said, and he leaned forward and told me very quietly, thank you for telling me that. I'm so relieved. He continued, you are young but I want to tell you something. The worst thing that can happen in this world is to be alone. I don't want your father to be alone. He told me that his life with my grandmother had been very difficult. He told me that in the years after his children had left home, there had been a time, 10 years, he said, that grandma had not talked to him. That had been before I was born. Grandma had retreated into religion to the extent that she went to church every day 
and spent almost all of her time saying the rosary quietly to herself. She would not talk to him. She wrote notes for him to go buy things at the store. Grandpa covered his face with his hands as he talked. He paused. I got up to get the coffee. He'd pulled himself together when I returned with the coffee. He asked me what were my plans. I told him that I was driving across the country. I would stay at Matthew's place in San Francisco for the holidays, and after that, go up to Washington State. I would try to get a job there. I told him I wanted to go to college eventually, but I would have to take classes one by one before I could go full time. There was a college in Olympia that some friends of mine were going to. I would get a job and see how it goes. He asked if I had a girl. I told him about Tracy, that I had liked her, but that it wasn't going to happen. So, no, I didn't have a girl, I told him. He said those sounded like reasonable plans. Then he said, if there's one thing I want to tell you, it is that the most important thing in life is not to be alone. Never live alone. We talked a little more. But then after a while, it seemed as if there was nothing more to say. I didn't know what to say. Grandpa sat with his hands over his face. Looking back on it now, I'm not sure why it seemed okay for me to leave. Had he said he wanted to be alone? I don't remember. Wouldn't the relatives be expected to call with news of Grandma's condition? Common sense tells me now that it would have been sensible to stay with Grandpa until we heard from the relatives, even to spend the night. I don't remember how it was that I left, but I did. I drove back to the motel. I should have called before I got the motel room. The next morning, I got up, brushed my teeth, found a place for breakfast, and got back on Interstate 90. I crossed into Pennsylvania. I passed Erie, onward into Ohio. Just before Cleveland, I got onto Interstate 71 South. As I remember it now, the relatives had told Grandpa that they'd check in on Grandpa, uh, Grandma at the hospital. In the morning, they would call Grandpa. I think it had been getting late and that it must have been appropriate for me to leave. But that visit had not gone as I had expected. I'd had no knowledge of any health issues my grandparents might have had. Grandpa had always been cheerful whenever I'd seen him before. Grandma had always been quiet. Very quiet. Too quiet. When they would come to visit us in New Hampshire when my mother was alive, it had always been a festive occasion. But Grandma would always seek the quiet of the living room, which was unused except for special occasions. She would sit in the quiet and hum, quietly humming along with her rosary prayers. That is, that is how she had always been. Grandpa would mingle normally with all of us. One time, years before, my brother Patrick had run upstairs from the basement where the kids of the family used to hang out. Mom was in the kitchen, and Pat had to fart, so he ran into the living room and let loose, only to notice afterward that Grandma was sitting there, praying silently. She pretended not to notice. When Pat returned downstairs, he told us all the story, and we laughed, but I could tell Pat was a little irritated at that. If I drove all day, I could make it to Louisville by dark. That was where my, elder, my oldest brother, Frank, and his wife, Sarah, lived. I would stay there for a couple days and then continue west. I wanted to be in San Francisco by Christmas. Frank had moved out from New Hampshire when I was still in elementary school. First, out to California with a bunch of his friends, he, uh, his friends. 
he had lived in California for a while and then settled in Kentucky and got married. He'd, uh, he'd said I could stay with them for a while, but after the visit with Grandpa, I wasn't sure that I wanted to go directly to Louisville that night. I wanted some time to just think about what had happened and how to digest it. I also had to think about what I was going to do with my life. I was already in Ohio when it occurred to me that I'd forgotten about Niagara Falls, but I had seen it many times before. I decided that I'd go as far as Columbus, get a motel room, go get some beers if I, uh, if I could. I didn't know what the drinking age was in Ohio. I had, I had to let it sink in that I was on my own. I was driving across the country. This country was my oyster. I wanted it to be a fun trip. I wanted to do something on my own. So that afternoon, with plenty of daylight left, I arrived on the outskirts of Columbus. I looked for a, a cheap motel in a place that didn't look too desolate, some place with a bar within walking distance where there might be a band playing. I got a room. There was a bar just up the street in a mini mall. There was a grocery store I could drive to, so I drove to the store and bought some food to make sandwiches in my room, and I bought beer. I remember, I remember it was Christian Moreland beer from Cincinnati. I wanted to try it. I learned that in Ohio they had a strange law. If you were over 18 but under 21, you could buy beer with a maximum alcohol content of 3.2%. If you were over 21, you could buy real beer. I put the real beer in my grocery basket with my food and checked out. I made it. They didn't card me. I went back to the motel and opened a beer. There was no refrigerator in the room, so I went to the ice machine and filled up a trash bin with ice. It seemed luxurious in a cheap sort of way. I turned on the TV. I took a shower and made a point of bringing a bottle of beer into the shower. For some reason, whenever I'd stayed in motels traveling with my friends, we had always done that. We regarded it to be the height of luxury to have beer in the shower. So that's what I did. But being alone, it didn't have the same effect. It didn't feel luxurious. It felt silly. I made a sandwich and watched TV until it got dark. The news came on. President Reagan was increasing aid to the El Salvadoran government and saying that the Sandinista government in Nicaragua posed an immediate threat to the United States. The wars were raging in Central America. I remember pondering at the time that I had considered joining the military just a few months before, when I realized that I was not going to be able to have a decent life working at the orchard. That was because Rock Mount Orchards had stopped providing medical insurance. When I had started working there right out of high school, they did provide it, Blue Cross Blue Shield. When Ted Castro, the boss, had announced to the crew that insurance had become too expensive, so Rock Mounts was going to stop providing it, he was almost tearful in regret. He really had felt he was let, that he was letting us down. At the time, I had no idea of what it meant not to have medical insurance. We all told Mr. Castro not to take it so hard. We'd be okay. We reassured him. But when I had mentioned that to my father, he explained that that was indeed a very serious thing. He said that a job that pays so little and that does not provide medical insurance is not, vi not a viable job. He had used that word, not viable. I didn't quite, uh, uh, I didn't quite, I didn't quit right off. I liked the work. I liked driving tractors and learning all about farming. Other workers at the orchard had wives and kids. It seemed like a good life, but then it became unviable. So I had thought about the military. 
Ted Castro, a former Marine, a World War II veteran, witness to the aftermath of Nagasaki, had not directly told me not to join, but he told me to regard the military as a war-fighting institution, period. He had mentioned the slogans on TV, recruiting ads, be all that you can be, and we're looking for a few good men. He reminded me that we often hear people say they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. I had heard that, I told him. He told me that the minute you are born, you are already part of something bigger than yourself, no matter who you are. To join the military, he said, is to surrender yourself to an institution that is beyond your control. That was an interesting way to put it, I thought. I admired Ted Castro. With his subtle wit, he resembled Mark Twain, mustache, spectacles, and all. Of course, he clarified they wouldn't say it that way on the TV ads. I had chuckled. I lay there on the bed in the motel room, almost 21 years old, and had to admit to myself that I had no idea of what I wanted to do with my life. Back in high school, I washed dishes at a restaurant near our house in New Hampshire. One guy, one guy who worked there, also as a dishwasher, was crazy, scarily crazy. His name was Steve, just like me. He told of having been in Vietnam. He said he'd been in a helicopter that had been shot down and he had been the only survivor. One night at the restaurant in the kitchen, I wasn't there for this, but I was told uh, he had become agitated about something. People tried to talk him down, but he got even more angry. He was shouting, causing a scene that the customers could hear, shouting that nobody understands. Nobody could understand. He took a knife and threatened to kill himself with it right there in the kitchen. Somehow, they talked him down. Pete Malm's sister had been there. She worked there, too. She's the one who told me about it. But Steve had often said never to trust the government. He, he, I'd heard that rant from him many times. He always went on that they had lied about the war, that the war had not been a noble cause, that the war had nothing to do with defending anybody. It was all just senseless killing. That was before Ronald Reagan became president, before he said said that on TV that the said on TV that the Vietnam War was a noble cause. Noble cause. He used those words. I had heard thoughts similar to Steve's from other Vietnam War veterans. Some had explained it more calmly, saying that when they were young, all the news and the words of the president on TV had made it all seem like to join up was the right thing to do. But once they got there, they learned that the side the Americans were supporting was not popular with its own people and was not worth supporting. They'd been had. I had tried to learn as much as I could about Latin America, about its history, because it looked like that was going to be the Vietnam of my generation. As I watched TV that night in the motel room in Columbus, Ohio, I realized that I knew almost nothing about it. But I could sense that the buildup I was watching in the newspapers and on the TV news, what President Reagan was saying, was probably the same as the buildup those Vietnam vets had watched and read some 15 or 20 years before, a president making a case for war. I think it was Ted Castro who had recommended I read War is a Racket by Marine Corps Brigadier, Brigadier General Smedley D. Butler. General Butler explained how in the 1920s and 30s he had worked to install brutal governments in many countries, governments that kept their people in peonage to provide cheap labor for American companies. I didn't want to fight to keep that system in place, the system Harry Belafonte was talking about in the Banana Boat song. 
the banana boat song. The first time I heard it was in the bunkhouse at the apple orchard when the Jamaicans had played it on the little record player, one of a hundred songs I had heard I heard in that place. The Jamaicans at the orchard in New Hampshire worked the same way as the banana picker in the song, just a different fruit. That night at the motel in Columbus, Ohio, was only a few weeks after the truck bomb attack on the marine barracks in Beirut, Lebanon, in which over 300 people had been killed, including 241 Americans. There in the motel, the news on TV showed the battleship USS New Jersey moored off the coast of Beirut, shelling the coast. I didn't know anything about why the Americans were there, but I remember now that even then, I suspected that sending in the World War II relic battleship had to be purely a, pure, a public relations stunt. Were its antiquated guns the best weapons available to support the Marines? I had no idea, but I suspected not. I remember joking to myself, talking to the TV, why don't they just go all out and send the USS Constitution, old Ironsides, to Beirut? It was, and still is, a commissioned ship in the Navy. I believe that sending the New Jersey was meant to pluck sentimental heartstrings, to gauze the lens of American perception so that they would look at footage of Lebanon and see Iwo Jima. It was the spoonful of sugar to help them swallow American participation in the Lebanese Civil War as if it were necessary but bitter medicine. It reminded me of the scene in the movie Dr. Strangelove, where the B-52 was damaged by the missile. The next few scenes show the plane flying low to avoid radar detection, and the shadow of the plane on the frozen ground is that of a B-17. The New Jersey provided the same sense of nostalgia to the Lebanese war. The Iran-Iraq war was raging. On that same news broadcast, Dan Rather said that Iraqi commanders claimed to have killed 10,000 Iranians in the past week. 10,000. There was no video footage with that story. It was just Dan Rather talking. Somehow, it didn't feel that the next big war, one in which the Americans might become embroiled on a large scale, would be in the Middle East. I was aware of my ignorance, but I suspected that the place would be Central America. That was what was on the news almost every night. I knew I needed to conduct due diligence to learn why the wars were happening before I would ever lend my support to them. Then, just a couple days after the Beirut truck bombing, the Americans invaded Grenada. Grenada? I had never heard of it before the invasion. The justifications they reported on the news seemed to me just that, justifications for an invasion. I had heard some people on tel television, talk, television talk of the Vietnam Syndrome, in quotation marks, meaning the unwillingness of the American public to back military action overseas in the wake of the failure of the Vietnam War. The politicians who used this phrase saw it as a problem that America had to overcome. I wondered if these small military adventures were meant to soften up public opinion toward, uh, towards more comprehensive wars in the future. As I recall, I never did go out to that bar up the street from the motel. I slept in the motel room and didn't even finish the whole six-pack of beer. I thought about Grandpa, dear, sweet, gentle Grandpa Phillips. Okay, that's the end of chapter two. So we're at, that was page 40. So next we'll do chapter three. That'll be in the next video.